Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode number 337, Dr. Michael Rich. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation. This is the show where we talk to some of the most fascinating minds working in all different realms of technology today. I'm Megan Maroney, and my guest today is Dr. Michael Rich, MD, PhD, I mean, MPH, MD, MPH, pediatrician. You might know him as the mediatrician. He's also a media enthusiast. He's the founder and the director of the Center of Me on Media and Child Health, and he answers all of our burning questions about screen time and fake Instagram accounts and the Facebook Messenger app. Uh, he's also authored papers on media and child health for the American Academy of Pediatrics. And he's written and presented testimony on media and child health to a variety of legislative bodies. And in a previous career, he was a filmmaker, worked with Kurosawa. And this, I think, makes him uniquely qualified to discuss how media affects our children today. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Rich. Thank you for having me. So first I wanted to ask you if you know of any longitudinal studies showing the effects of smartphone or tech or any kind of tech addiction or social media addiction, any, any longitudinal studies. I mean, this is really, the iPhone's only been around for 10 years. So, so a lot of people say it causes this, it causes that, but do we know of any studies that, and, and what do those studies say? Uh, there are no longitudinal studies yet. I mean, they're being conducted now by our center and others, I presume. Um, but um, we have bigger um, questions to ask than just, you know, what has happened between the introduction of the smartphone to now. Um, and, and that is how are, how is the use of these devices affecting the way brains are actually developing, the way, the way children's brains develop in response to the environment. Um, one of the reasons that we end up with the most sophisticated and resilient brain in the animal kingdom is in part because we are born with the most embryonic brain. In a sense, we cannot keep ourselves alive as newborns. We need parents, we need others to keep us warm, to feed us, to shelter us. Um, but what that means is that we get to build our brain in response to the challenges and stimuli presented by the environment in which it needs to function. Now that we are putting these devices in the hands of younger and younger children, um, are we actually influencing the trajectory of that brain development? Because one of the things that we do know is what's good for building strong and complex brains is a variety of stimuli that are not given by screens, such as face-to-face -face interactions with other human beings, particularly mom and dad, siblings, those we have relationships with, um, the ability to manipulate the physical world, um, stacking up blocks, knocking them down, um, and open-ended problem-solving play. And even the best of um, edutainment software that you can get on these devices actually is a, a skills and drills type of phenomenon where it gives you choices that are right or wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you point out the fa the face to face meaning being so important because I know a lot of people who um, argue that you know everything's fine, you know, keep giving iPhones to seven year olds. Say, well, they said the same thing about movies, and they said the same thing about TV, and they said the same thing about books, and everything was going to ruin our children. And I know you're not one of those people, but but the the more time we spend on the screen, the less time we're talking to each other, the less time we're having face to face interaction. And I know there was one study about about the effects of em empathy on kids, especially middle school age kids. 
what do you know about the that how this is affecting kids in terms of how empathetic they are to one another? Well, I think that one of the things that we are seeing right now with middle schoolers in particular, and um, this is the clinical population with whom I work, which is adolescents, um, early adolescents through early adults, really. Um, and, and that is that with this amazing connectivity we have with these devices, we actually are less deeply connected than we used to be. Um, our connectedness is what protects us health-wise, um, socially. Um, and we are, instead of using these devices to strengthen relationships, we, in some ways we are interposing them between us in many cases. Um, the natural human tendency is to avoid intimacy if we possibly can. So um, it, it's much easier to text somebody than to call them. It's much easier to call them than to get face to face with them. As such, um, actually the social media can be uh, a good developmental stage for young people who are trying to figure out how they feel about uh, a romantic, potential romantic partner, et cetera. Um, but it's a stage that they need to move through to greater and greater intimacy. Uh, so although it remains to be seen what happens with, with empathy, um, there are some early signs that we are distancing ourselves from each other. We are what Sherry Turkle calls alone together. Um, kids will sit right next to each other and text each other instead of being in each other's presence. And uh, one of the things that I think is also concerning is the fact that parents are doing this as well. So they are not only not teaching their children to connect, but they are modeling for them this kind of aloneness where they're connected only with their devices. Yeah, I definitely see that uh, at at my house. My um, I have a 14 year old and two 12 year olds. And my daughter, whenever she sees me on, on my phone, my 14-year-old daughter, she just yells screenager at me, which is her way of... <laughs> <laughs> You're busted, mom. <laughs> yes. And it's great. Like, I'm very glad that she points it out every time. I mean, it's, you know, it's everyone, everyone in our five-person family is guilty of not paying attention to the other people in our family. And every one of us feels bad about it, but yet we still do it. I mean, we're not, you know, we, we try not to. We have certain rules, not at the table, not in the car. But it is, I mean, we're all, all of us are addicted to our devices in some some way. So. Well, I, I would like to um, take issue a little bit with the term addiction. Um, because, uh, first of all, um, we throw it around colloquially all the time. I'm addicted to shopping or I'm addicted to um, binge watching a certain television show. Um, but coming from the medical perspective, um, addiction is not only a very specific thing, but a very scary thing. And um, when parents think of ad addiction, say, to uh, the Internet or to, um, uh, you know, video games, uh, I think that they think of bums on skid row sucking down cheap wine or a junkies in a shooting gallery and not about their 10 year old who has a hissy fit because he has to stop playing minecraft and go to bed um and so we actually are stepping away from the term addiction uh both because it is uh medically inaccurate but also because i think it keeps people from taking what's going on with their children in earlier stages seriously enough to address it when it's easier to address. That's a really good point. I mean, I tend to think of it, I use it in terms of um, doing something when it makes me feel bad afterward, but that doesn't really, you know, I, if I eat a pint of ice cream, I also feel bad afterwards and I don't go around saying I'm addicted to ice cream, but um, I guess just really focusing on how it feels like that, that's what um, I've been thinking more and more about, like just how this, how you feel afterwards and kind of, you know, try, trying to only do the things that, that, you know, serve you in your life. Um, but I want to talk a little bit, I first heard about you, um, we 
you were part of the shareholders letter to Apple a few months ago um, talking about the effects of phones on kids. And that was, you know, there's been a lot of mumbling about this. You brought up Sherry Turkle, who's been talking about this forever. She used to be just, I felt like the, the lone voice um, saying, you know, this, that, that alone together, that idea that like we're not really as connected as we think we are. But now it's become just a chorus of people saying, uh, I don't, you know, th this is, there's something not right here. But your letter um, with Jana, it seemed to be the first time that someone was actually targeting the bottom line of these companies, specifically Apple. Can you talk a little bit about how you got involved with this? Uh, in a very interesting roundabout way, um, I am doing a big research project, actually a longitudinal research project with um, about 3,000 young people in Alberta, Canada. Um, and one of my research partners up there is the Alberta Teachers Association. Um, and I believe one of the leadership of CalSTRS, the California State Teachers Retirement System, heard me speak. Um, and that's what led to Calsters getting together with Jana and then coming to us um, with the idea that we developed together of not of attacking um, and laying blame on Apple or anyone else, but with the idea that we have now evolved to a point where we believe that these technologies need to be developed from the ground up with the consequences to child health and development in mind. And to bring this body of research that we have conducted and collected over the years to bear at the earliest stages with some of the best tech engineers in the world. Um, and uh, the reason we went to Apple is not because they are you know, making something worse than anybody else, but that they are such a beacon of, of leadership in the tech field, that if we can bring Apple together with the scientists who've done this work, um, we believe that the others will follow. Well, yeah, I think that um, it's it's always amazing to me that you know Steve Jobs never he did when the iPad was invented. He's famously never let his kids use one, <laughs> and so uh, it's interesting yes. that um, I mean I don't think that he imagined that it would be so popular with little children. Um, but I, you know you have this amazing advice column. I read through so much of it. I I wish. I had had it 14 years ago, but I wanted to go through some of the, the ages and stages, which is important because what's important, you know, the, the answers to questions about preschoolers are going to be different for teenagers. And so I just wanted to, I, I gathered some questions from uh, some of the people, my friends on Facebook and Twitter and um, just some, some basics. So I, di I didn't have a, I didn't have a smartphone when my daughter was born in 2003, but I do remember nursing and checking my email on my laptop um, at the same time. What are your thoughts on this kind of multitasking, like the, you know, texting and, and breastfeeding, which you call brexting, which I really like? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you were fortunate enough to experience the real magic that occurs when a child and mom are face-to-face -face breastfeeding. Um, and... You know, this is um, the reality is that this is one of the best and most special bonding moments you've had. Um, now that your daughter, I think it's your daughter is 14, mm -hmm. um, you probably long for the simplicity and the unconditional love that you felt at that point <laughs> from time to time. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and, and but but this is extraordinarily important because this is when your child is seeking connection with you, looking deep into your eyes, um, reading every twitch of your facial muscles as you smile, as you laugh, and also reading the fact that you are distracted if you are looking at a screen. Um, and what that signals to the developing and very primitive mind of the child is, I am not the most important thing in this person's life. There is something that is more important. How can I get her attention back? Um, and so um, what you will notice when you observe children who are 
um, breastfeeding who are playing while their parents are using devices, um, sometimes you'll see this in the playground, is that they will increasingly become louder, become more rambunctious, or in the playground take greater risks um, because they're not getting the attention they need. They're not getting the supervision that they need for their safety. Um, and so one of the things that we really feel the research shows is, first of all, multitasking doesn't exist. The human brain monotasks. It toggles between things very quickly, but it's not doing two things simultaneously. We do not think in stereo. Um, what we do do, though, is we skate over the superficial uh, aspects of things to keep the child from killing herself, to you know um, keep the, the pot from boiling over. Um, but we don't have that kind of deep involvement that both interhuman connectivity requires, but also deep thought about things require. Um, so you are neither doing your, you know, justice to your emails and you're certainly not doing justice to the baby. Mm -hmm. So what about handing And I don't mean to make you feel guilty. I'm sorry. I don't mean to make you feel guilty. <laughs> no, that's I know that's not that, the point of this. No. That that is I, the I other think, issue here. Like that kind of parental judgment and it often comes down on the mother and I know you've written about that as well. Right. And you know, you know, um here here's the thing. When I grew up there weren't seat belts in cars. That doesn't mean that as we gain more knowledge, gain more experience and more information, we don't use these things. So we can't look back and say, oh, my God, I ruined my child because she had a television in her bedroom or because she got a smartphone too early or whatever. Um, parenting is more of an art than a science. That doesn't mean we can't use science to inform it. But ultimately, we're all going to parent our children differently, even differently between children in the same family. Um, and we're all going to make mistakes. We will never do it perfectly. That doesn't mean that we can't work very hard to perfect it and get closer and closer to the good. Um, but we also have to go in expecting ourselves to make mistakes and forgive ourselves and keep moving forward. So what about, um, what about YouTube? What do you have a, an age recommendation that you would give for when, when it would be okay to watch, watch YouTube? Well, I mean, th this is a more complicated question than that because um, the issue is no longer about screen time, but about the content and the context in which that content is consumed. Um, so um, I, I think that with YouTube, one of the issues is not only content, but the ability of the child to self-regulate because YouTube and Netflix are all designed to pull you in and keep you in and hook you in to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing with, with links, um, with very sophisticated algorithms determining what exactly it is that you're most interested in and will keep you engaged essentially indefinitely. Um, and so, you know, the, what the, the real problem is, at what age can a child go to YouTube to get what she or he wants from it and then be able to step away from it and, and not um, get consumed or, or sucked in? So, you know, if, if you were to ask if that is the ideal, what the perfect age for starting on YouTube is, I would say about 99. Um, because we all get sucked in. Um, and, and, and this is a learning process, but it's also a neurodevelopmental process in the sense that, you know, a child needs the uh, air traffic controller of their prefrontal cortex, um, their executive functions of impulse control, future thinking, cause and effect, to really get better at um, using these tools in ways that are mindful and focused, which also means being constantly aware of what is being displaced by their time on screen. Um, so that's a long way around saying um, I think that YouTube has amazing things on it if you use it as a search engine to look up you know, a, a performance by Bob Dylan at the Newport Folk Festival or, uh, you know, um, a, 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 an expedition up Mount Everest. Um, 
However, it is incredibly seductive um, to go to it and just say, let's see what's on. Let's see where it leads me. So I think that it's important for the parent to be involved in the child's use of YouTube, not necessarily sitting beside them and co-viewing the whole time, but you know, having them view it in a public situation where they can um, be aware of what's going on for the child, be there to support the child if they end up in places that are confusing or upsetting to them, which can happen very easily. Um, there was recently concern about uh, YouTube kids, because at least it presented itself as being essentially a safe walled garden where kids could see uh, YouTube videos that were correct for them. And these were easily hacked with, you know, cartoon characters that look perfectly benign or Paw Patrol. Um, and then they would be seen having sex or um, hurting each other or killing each other um, in, in these mashups. So I think that ultimately what we need to do is be as present for our children in the digital space as we are for them in the physical space. Yeah, I mean, that tends to get very hard once they get to be older. Um, and yeah, I guess it's a lot of the work you're, you're doing in the, those beginning years. I want to move on to... Um, and, and let, me, let, me, let me actually add to that, which is sort of interesting, which is, you know, Everything gets harder when they get in the older years. You know, they don't want you to go to parties with them. They don't want you to um, know exactly where they are at all times. So this is part of helping them learn to take responsibility for themselves. And that's ultimately what from infancy through childhood to adolescence and adulthood, what parenting is all about is keeping them safe, keeping them nurtured when they're younger but slowly giving them the tools to take care of those things for themselves so that by the time they're adults, they're, they're self-sufficient. And the same thing in the digital space. So when they start off in the digital space, you work it with them, you, you, you play the games with them, you um, go online with them, and you slowly step back and watch to see how well they do, helping them where they need help, stepping away when they are exerting both independence and responsibility for that independence. Yeah, and I mean, my uh, favorite thing to say that's truer than anything right now is parenting is not for the weak. <laughs> I mean, no, the conversations, you know, I know I knew one of my kids was a follower of Logan Paul, who was the YouTuber who, um, you know, uh, filmed a person who had recently committed suicide. So, you know, January 2nd of this year, that's how I started off this year, having to have a conversation with all three of my children about, did you see, you know, this? Yes, they did. Let's talk about it. You know, and it's just things you'd never expect you would have to talk about. And they're not easy conversations to have. Um, but yeah, I mean, with you, I guess um, with YouTube, and in terms of like you, you were talking about how YouTube really the, the biggest problem with it is that side of the, you know, the screen where it's like recommended this, recommended this. I mean, the way you described it, it sort of seemed like back in the day when we used to flip through the channels, but it's so different because now those videos are tailored specifically to our interests and needs and, you know, what YouTube, what the algorithm thinks we're going to want next. Um, and so that, that idea of self-regulation is really difficult. And so can you talk a little bit about how you can help teach kids self-regulation with technology um, starting in, you know, in, in the, as soon as they use technology? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think the first thing is right from the beginning when we introduce these devices and these applications on the devices, we treat them as tools. We don't treat them either as you know something that is divinely bestowed on us at birth that, and we are entitled to, nor do we treat it as a special treat that is either to be given when we're good or withdrawn when we're bad. They are tools, they are very powerful tools. Um, and so an analogy I'll sometimes use is a power saw. You know, with a power saw, you can build beautiful things, but you don't hand a power saw to your two-year-old and say, go for it. But you may, with your two-year-old, start woodworking and putting things together in certain ways, first with glue and then maybe with a hammer and nail. Um, and then you finally get to a handsaw and then a power saw. But the same thing with these tools, which is you treat them as tools that do certain things really well, that don't do everything really well. Um, so you go to them for what they do, 
you turn them off and do something else um, because Ultimately, what we owe our children is a rich and diverse menu of experience um, that includes media, but includes walks in the woods and uh, time around the dinner table arguing and all the things that go into a a rich life. But um, ultimately, what we need to do is not be intimidated by the technology or intimidated by the fact that our children seem so much better at it than we are. But we have to be there in that space for them. And ultimately, perhaps the most important thing is that we model for them self-regulated behavior. And we don't bring our smartphones to the dinner table. We don't uh, get involved in a conversation with them and and are constantly looking at our phones or responding to every ping. So I think that between the being present and the and modeling um, and recognizing that this is part and parcel of parenting in the digital age, um, we will pass on to our children the behaviors, first of all, that we use, that we are doing, um, but that hopefully that we want them to be doing in their lives. And as with your child, we are listening to them when they call us on our mistakes. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to keep talking to Dr. Rich, but first I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Rocket Mortgage. If you need a mortgage, you don't want to have to go into a place and talk to a person and have to do all that. You want to just use your phone. You want to use your technology. You want to master your technology. Use it in the way that makes you feel good, like we talked about before, and getting a loan will make you feel really good. The mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated and needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Rocket Mortgage has trusted partners that allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage with just a touch of a button on your phone or your tablet. It's powerful. So whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in just a few seconds. Based on your income, your assets, and your credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify and find the one that's just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply. Understand fully. Mortgage confidently. Goodbye paperwork. I hate paperwork. It's too much paper. Leave the paper on the trees, I say. Use Rocket Mortgage. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. That's rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for the support of Triangulation. Okay, so this is a big one. My kids didn't have, we didn't have a TV until they were like five or six. Um, they weren't allowed to have any screens. So therefore, whenever they went over to anyone's house, that's all they wanted to do. Like they just, and people used to say, well, that's because you don't let them do it at home. If you let them do it at home, they wouldn't want it so bad. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, that's very interesting you would say, say that because uh, as uh, you're probably aware, I often do talks to large groups of Uh, parents or uh, employees of major corporations and things like that. And there's always one or two people who come up to me and very self-righteously say, you know, we don't have a television in our house. We never will. And I'll say, go out and get one quick. Um, (laughs) Because your children need to learn, all of our children need to learn to live in a world with screens because the moment they get out of your house with no televisions, they're going to go to it uh, like uh, in the Chris Van Allsburg book, The Wretched Stone. I don't know if you ever read that one um, to your children, but I highly recommend it. Um, and it's really a, an allegory about uh, about screens and about television. Um, but I think that what we need to do is teach them to use these tools and to regulate themselves at each stage of their life in the ways that their level of brain development will allow them to do so. Um, Because ultimately we are scaffolding them as they build themselves and pulling away that scaffold as they get older. Um, So 
First of all, I think that using screen media is a learned behavior, and we are their best teachers and modelers in that. Um, and and secondly, I think that as we um, approach uh, the use of these screens, what we need to do is help them determine, first of all, uh, help them to understand that what is on that screen was manufactured by somebody with the intent of first capturing their attention and secondly acting act having them act in certain ways whether it's buying toothpaste or uh, voting for someone um, or you know uh, wanting a certain piece of consumer goods and um, I think that once they know that this is not sort of reality, but that this is a manufactured reality, and once they know that in the social media environment, um, and I include things like YouTube and that, anything that uses an algorithm to focus and narrow cast to you things that you're already interested in, they need to be aware not only that they're being uh, profiled and targeted, but that they are entering an echo chamber where all they see and hear will all will reinforce uh, what they already think they know, what they already want, et cetera. Um, and so, I think that uh, you know your your friends were right. What what your kids were responding to is what I call the forbidden fruit syndrome. If you have to restrict something or ban it completely, it must be really good. Um, and and so that is why now we don't recommend screen time limits. Um, screen time limits essentially are an obsolete concept in the day and age where kids are handing iPad handed iPads in school. That where they are getting their homework online, where they're creating study groups with Skype. Um, and so I think that what we need to do is take a step back and with your child, conceive of their 24 hour day as an empty glass that they fill up with this many hours of sleep. And remember, teenagers actually need more sleep than younger kids um, because of the rapid growth spurt during adolescence. So get the ideal amount of sleep if you can. See how much time it takes to do homework. Um, realize that you like to play basketball and want to go outside and fill up that glass with all the things you want to do. And I would always include in that a sit down family meal every day without devices, because that's perhaps the single most protective thing you can do for your children's mental health as well as their nutrition. Um, and then see what time is left. And what you're doing there is you're reversing the default to the screen paradigm. You are saying, we're going to use this mindfully and consciously. We're going to go to it for certain things at certain times. But we're also recognizing that we really like to play basketball and, and we really need to sleep and do our homework. And we, it's really healthy, healthy for us to uh, sit with our family and talk through the day. Um, and so we're teaching our children to prioritize, um, to put things in perspective, and to manage their time, um, which is ultimately uh, what the, the screens can steal from us. Remember, um, the president of Netflix said his major competitor is sleep. So let's say hypothetically you didn't <laughs> let your children watch TV and they became... <laughs> Not addicted to it. <laughs> but, um, like, what do you? But this sounds. This sounds. This sounds like saying I have this friend who might be pregnant. Yes. I'm asking for a friend. Um, so, uh, yeah. I mean, we've all made certain. You know, we've all. We. You know, you're always going to mess up as a parent. Um, but Absolutely. you know, you have teenagers that really do have trouble self-regulating for for whatever reason. And the idea of no screen time limits. Like, I personally think then that, that means. Um, you know, not all of my kids, but some of them might just then use their, uh, you know, use an iPad or an iPhone or play Minecraft, um, you know, not or just, you know, watch science videos on YouTube or, you know, whatever. But they, I really do feel like they would do it in place of everything else, including homework or basketball, um, you know, and mm -hmm. there might be just that time that we make them put it away at dinner. I mean, what, how do you, how do you teach self-regulation at a, at a later year around, a lot later, and not just for kids. I mean, I, I, I need that help too. Well, 
Uh, first of all, if you sit down with your child or with yourself um, or with that hypothetical friend of yours um, <laughs> and, and, and actually plot out your day, um, even the kids who are going to watch YouTube all day long if left to their just desserts <laughs> um, are not going to say, I want to sit and watch YouTube all day. Right, they're just not going to do that. Um, they they will say, "I want to do this and I want to do that," and I want to, and then you say, "Okay, so this is our plan." You follow the plan, and if they don't follow the plan, um, then there are consequences, and you talk about the consequences again at the beginning when they get or before they get the cell phone, and and say, "Okay, here's what you use it for. Here's what you don't use it for." And let's decide together what consequences should be if, if you overstep. And they will often say, well, I, I guess I should lose the phone. Um, and the, part, the parenting of an adolescent is very much about um, giving them a little bit more freedom, like letting the leash out for a dog, seeing what they do. And if they handle it well, fine, you give them a little more leash. But if they don't handle it well, you pull it back. And, and, and you say, okay, we're going to try again. Um, it really is a, a, a time of trial and error and of taking responsibility, falling down, skinning your knee, picking yourself up and trying again. And so I think that what you can do then is say, okay, here's what we decided and here's what's happening. I think, you know, why don't we take the the iPad back for a week and let you lower your level of hyperstimulation and we will try again. Um, and, you know, if that is the plan from the outset, it is a lot easier to do than it is to do, you know, without announcing them, that to them, without developing that plan with them. The whole point of this is not only to teach them prioritization and time management, but to give them increasing ownership of their behavior. Um, and the real problem with screens is just sort of sliding into it as a default behavior and not having anything that pulls you out of it. And what about using it as, as a soothing um, mechanism? That's what I, um, I feel like there's so much, I mean, as teenagers, there's so much going on in relationships and it's all, a lot of that is happening um, in text messages. And so, you know, I, I find, I see a lot of kids that will just like play Candy Crush or something like that just because it's, you know, they, they'll go to their phones to do one thing, see a message, feel uncomfortable about it. But I've talked to some of my mom friends about that and they said, I think you're projecting that. Like, I don't think that's what kids are doing. Do you think that kids are using these devices to soothe themselves through the difficulty of adolescence? Absolutely. Um, I, I, you know, and I think this is why um, some kids get uh, in trouble with the screens, um, you know, with gaming, with social media, sometimes with pornography, um, or even just watching these endless videos, um, which is that it's a way of um, entering a very controllable environment when much of adolescence feels like total chaos, when it feels like the whole world is confusing. I, I can't even see what I figure out what's going on with my body. Um, I, my, I, I'm, I'm happy one minute, I'm crazy the next, I'm sad the next. Um, so to enter into the world of Candy Crush or um, the world of YouTube videos or musically um, allows them to enter a very safe kind of enclosed space where not only do they feel uh, they can predict what is going to happen to a certain degree, but that they control it. Um, and this is especially pointed for kids who have baseline anxiety or baseline attention deficit. Um, and they're the ones who are most susceptible in many ways to sort of getting sucked into um, the interactive media world and having a difficulty to extract themselves. And so, so do you have different recommendations for kids who've been diagnosed with maybe anxiety issues or ADHD or any kind of attention issues? Are there different, different considerations for parents and, and screens? Well, um, I think it, I, would, I would reverse that 
around a little bit because we have um, just recently um, opened what we believe to be the first um, dedicated clinic for kids who have problematic interactive media use, or PIMU is what we're calling it, um, so that it's not an addiction and it's not uh, a device or, or uh, an application directed, but it's really focused on our use. Um, and the interesting thing is that even though this is not a recognized diagnosis, um, we are starting to see from the hundreds of kids we've seen with this um, that there that it may not be a standalone diagnosis, but may actually be a syndrome of symptoms that occur in this new environment from known conditions such as attention deficit or anxiety. Um, and they look different and they may not even be clinically apparent in any other environment, but that some kids easily get sucked into it. So I, what I would say is um, to look at your kids' behavior with interactive media as one indicator of how they are doing regarding attention, regarding anxiety, regarding you know their um, mental well-being in the world. Um, not to be scared for them so much as to see that as yet another uh, thermometer, if you will, of how they're doing. Well, you brought up pornography, which nobody likes to talk about. Um, I can assure you my children don't like to talk about it. <laughs> but they like to talk about it with each other. They don't yeah. like to talk about it right, with, with you. Me. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Um, yeah. But I mean, I've just, I've just read a lot, um, listened to The Butterfly Effect, which is a podcast about the pornography industry and how many... Uh, is just how prevalent it is. And I don't, I mean, and I've read that, you know, you've answered questions too, and I, do, I don't want to scare people, but it is just something that people don't feel comfortable talking about. People don't feel comfortable talking about kids and sexuality at all. But so many kids, so many young kids have access to pornography and it's, um, and I just want to spend some time talking about that. What are, what effects are you seeing? What can parents do? Because, you know, I, will talk to my parents say, I mean, my kids, I don't want to talk to my parents about it either. <laughs> I will talk to my kids <laughs> and say, you know, I know this is prevalent. Like I listened, I heard about it on a podcast. And um, so I just want to let you know, it's normal for you to want to, and it's our expectation that you won't with, you know, our devices. Um, but if you need to talk about it and they're, they basically say, mom, that's disgusting. Please stop talking about that. What, what, are, yeah. what do you say? Uh, what are your suggestions about parents? T how you young should you address this with children? And I know there there's no such thing as a parental control that can keep kids from from seeing it. So, so what do we do? Well, I, you know, I think this is one of the places where our double standard in society of um, feeling that uh, sex is wrong or immoral, but also, you know, we're strongly attracted to it, which is, in fact, biological. Um, and, and, and we get caught in the right and wrong values debate. And as a physician um, and as a child health researcher, um, I think that it helps us all to take a step back and say, okay, let's not talk about morality here. Let's talk about, just as we do with violent media or with media portraying uh, smoking or drinking, let's talk about how exposure to these materials changes us re at different ages in different ways, et cetera. Um, I, I, I've seen data that indicates that the average first age of exposure to porn, usually inadvertently because they have very effective cookies to draw you into these places, um, that it is now nine years old. Um, and we need as a society to take a step back and say, what are we doing in terms of educating to children to healthy sex, to healthy relationships, to respecting each other, to not objectifying each other, um, and for tying sex to relationship, to commitment, um, to consequences of sex? Um, and so um, what I am seeing um, in terms of clinical outcomes is not so much that these kids um, get in trouble with extreme sex so much as that they either 
treat sex like a commodity um, so that, you know, because they can see it with one click on screen where it's easily available, um, where it seems like everybody wants it and everybody get, you know, gets it. Um, so I see it more contributing to a casual attitude towards sex, um, disconnected from relationships, the friends with benefits effect. Um, and so I think that that's one piece of it. The other piece of it that I'm seeing, and, and this is especially in young adult men, is that because pornography is an easy way for them to achieve sexual gratification without the overcoming the fear of intimacy of actually connecting with someone without all the messiness and emotionality of developing a relationship that end up in their young adulthood and they have never negotiated that fear of intimacy so they don't even know how to date and they're essentially sexually retarded because they've been spending their adolescence with pornography and now as young adults in college or out in life really don't know how to negotiate human relationships, um, uh, one-on-one -on -one romantic relationships. Um, so I think that the more we can speak openly and honestly about sexual behavior um, as a normal thing among adults, at times when children are less weirded out by it, um, you know, as weirded out as your 14-year-old is, um, when she was nine or eight, they're not weirded out by it. It just doesn't mean anything to them. And in some ways, you know, I, I, I have sort of a strange family because both my wife and I are adolescent medicine physicians. So we hand out condoms like M&Ms. Um, and so uh, we, we've been talking about this with our kids since they were very young and it's, it's no big deal. Um, but I think that that may not be such a bad model for having sex come out of the darkness as a normal, healthy human behavior for the right people at the right time and um, not make it into this dirty situation um, that should be hush hush and embarrassing. Um, and finally, the one thing I would also add to that is that sometimes um, these young people who um, have spent a lot of time with porn are feel very inadequate, um, both in their own um, anatomy and their behaviors, as well as those of their partner, because they're comparing them against these kind of super sex objects. I mean, isn't that a case with all of social media to some extent? I mean, it's um, the the Instagram and, um, you know, it's, it's like you... I mean, when we grew up, it was magazines, but now, you know, it's just we're spending so much time on these websites with these these pictures perfectly, you know, um, fixed up so that it doesn't look like reality anymore. Uh, absolutely. And but when we were with magazines, we were with magazines looking at at pop stars and movie stars and things like that. Now we're looking at social media and it's our peers, mm -hmm. um, all of whom seem to have the best outfits, go on the best vacations, have the funnest parties, um, and we feel like complete losers in relationship to that. Um, you know, social media ultimately is a marketing tool um, and it is a profoundly effective one for narrow casting your interests to you in terms of com consumer goods. But what we have fallen into as a society is using it to market ourselves or in the case of parents, our children to the rest of the world. Um, and we're not showing our authentic selves. We're not showing our vulnerabilities. And these are the things that make deep relationships really valuable, um, is our ability to be real with each other. And I think we lost a lot when friend became a verb. Yeah. So, and what about um, just the, the, not just sex, but sexualized pictures um, on, on Instagram, things like that. I mean, I, I see a lot of kids just making, you know, faces and, you know, just posing in ways. Um, do you think that, is that part, is that affecting our kids and, and what can, 
what kind of conversations would you suggest around those kinds of conversations? And also around like sending, sending intimate photos um, as teenagers, because I know that's another thing that people don't want to talk about. And, you know, it's um, and people say, oh, you'll go to jail if you do it. But that's sort of ignoring the impulse to do it. It, exactly. Um, I, I've had a 15-year-old girl tell me that sexting is the new second base, um, that that this is seen um, certainly as, as mature or adult behavior um, that is one of the ways in which you um, work toward an intimate uh, and um, uh, hopefully monogamous relationship with somebody. Um, so I think that you know, to the law is ultimately a blunt instrument for dealing with this, you know, because the reality is that sexting ultimately with underage kids is child pornography. Um, and even the 13 year old girl who sends her topless picture, um, you know, via the internet is guilty of a class C felony child pornography. So I think we have to take a step back first of all, as a society and say, should this really be criminalized or should this be something that we acknowledge and teach about and ultimately teach our children that not just the sexting, but even the other um, less uh, less prurient stuff. So, so less, you know, I mean, even just the making of faces or the, you know, posing in the bikini or um, holding a beer can at a party. Um, have them recognize that they are creating a digital footprint that is going to last far beyond this moment. Um, and, you know, this is tough with kids who can't even plan next week, let alone the concept of applying to college or applying to jobs in the future. Um, so we need to help them understand that they need to put themselves out as the person they want to be seen, not just now, but also 10 years from now. And, and so I think that we need to teach them um, in, in a whole lot of ways to respect themselves and respect others in this space, just as we do in, in, in the physical space in the world where we say, you know, uh, treat people kindly, um, treat people um, in the ways that you want to be treated. Um, but that also goes in this space to treat yourself the way you want to be treated. And if you don't want to be seen as a slut um, or as a drinker, um, don't portray yourself as that, even if it feels cool at the time. So I, I used to work for Microsoft Family Safety, um, and in the early 2000s, our big uh, thing that we would say all the time was there's no computer in in the bedroom because that was when the you know it was a desktop computer. Nobody had smartphones. The fewer people had laptops, so never in the bedroom, never in the bedroom. I know now that that is not practical, or is it practical? I mean, does it? Do you think that teenagers still need to be? I know you said watching YouTube. Um, I mean, I try to encourage my kids to watch YouTube. You can get it on the TV and in the living room, but usually they are taking to their own rooms. They do, and I I do. I want to respect the wanting to be by yourself. But, I mean, does it make sense to ask, you know, 12, 13-year-olds that they can't use iPhones or iPads or computers in their room? Um, I think that depends on you as the parent and what you, um, what you want for them. Um, I, I, I am seeing more and more kids who are having a harder and harder time sleeping um, because they take their, their phones to the room with them and they are up later and later at night. Um, texting each other. Um, they are, quote, keeping their phone with them because it's their alarm clock, um, as if you can't go to the store and buy a $5 alarm clock. Um, <laughs> but what's really happening is that they are in this constant state of alertness, you know, with their phone under their pillow or on their bedside stand on vibrate so they can get that all important WTF at three in the morning and respond to it. Um, and so, um, I, I, I do think that we should, again, not only think of these devices as tools to use for, you know, in the ways that they are best used, 
but also think of the spaces and contexts of our life for what they are best for. You know, the bedroom is for sleeping. Um, it, it, it is for a place of respite, um, not a place um, to hide away and um, sort of while away the endless hours um, with back and forth texting with people. And what I suggest to my families is that um, they set a time as a family when the kids are offline um, and the phones are charged in the kitchen or they're charged in mom and dad's room. Um, and that the kids then say to their friends, I have the most strict, meanest family in the world, but they make me go offline, so, you know, at eight o'clock or whatever. Um, let the kids throw the parents under the bus. They, you know, um, everybody's parents are cooler than your parents anyway. Um, so there's no loss here. Um, so I think that the issue here really is thinking about what these tools do for us when they are best used, when they are best not used, um, what they displace when they are used, um, and make active choices for how to use them, when to use them, and where to use them. So is there... Um I mean, I gather there's really a difference between, you know, the way you see Minecraft versus Snapchat versus, you know, FaceTime. I mean, is there some kind of media pyramid you have that like the best kind of media versus the worst? <laughs> um, well, um yeah, I mean, first of all, um, one of the things that we do as a research organization as opposed to an advocacy organization is um, we don't endorse or damn anybody. Um, uh, there are a lot of good reasons for it, not the least of which is, you know, we want people to actually trust our findings as opposed to worrying that we are in one person's pocket or one company's pocket or another. But the other reason for that is that these um, ecosystems created by the various social media environments um, shift and morph and change all the time depending on the users. Um, and that is one of the beauties of it, but it's also uh, one of the potential perils. Um, and so if I were to say to you today, this is the best and this is the worst, um, it would literally be different six weeks from now. Um, and, 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 and I think that this is the problem that some of these companies, such as the YouTube, ki YouTube Kids phenomenon, um, are getting into trouble because they try to um, create spaces that are either safe or kid-friendly or however you want to define them. But ultimately, they are subject to who participates and you know what goes on there. And it is immensely attractive to hackers to go into something like YouTube Kids and say, how can we sneak some nasty stuff through just as a challenge? And so I think that what's more important is this concept of using these media with your kids, not just to see what's there and, you know, restrict or redirect, um, but also to have an ongoing dialogue with them because usually the problems in these spaces are not big, awful things, but are subtle, subtle things. And so just as you might at, um, at, a, we at a family wedding uh, talk to your child about, you know, yeah, look at – uh, uh, Uncle, you know, Joe, he's drunk. Um, you, do you really want to do that? Do you really want to, you know, go there? Um, we are always teaching our kids what, you know, good behavior looks like, how we need to be with each other and with ourselves. And we can do that online. So in many ways, using these tools is a lot like teaching your child to drive an automobile where you sit white knuckled in the front seat beside them um, and help them learn to drive, not to avoid hitting that pedestrian or that tree, but to learn to drive in uh, effective ways that also happen to be safe. Um, and so one of the things that perhaps is, is heresy that I often say to people in this field is we've got to get rid of the term internet safety um, because it presumes that the internet is an unsafe place. And instead of playing defense all the time, we should be teaching our chil 
children to master these tools. And so we talk about internet or digital mastery, not literacy, not safety, not citizenship, but mastery because let's face facts, all kids and all of us want to feel that we are masters of an experience and of a space in our lives. That's such good advice because that's I mean, what we were talking about earlier. Like, so that it's not controlling you. You are, you know, you're in charge still of how much time you spend and what you're looking at and and the algorithm isn't yeah. controlling your life. Well, Dr. Rich, thank yeah. you so much for taking so much time. I feel like I just had an hour therapy session. Um, I hope it was helpful <laughs> to other people watching. Uh, Dr. Michael Rich is uh, a, um, he is the mediatrician and the founder of the Center on Media and Child Health. That's at cmch.tv. And uh, if if you want to ask a question, you can ask him a question there. Either he has so many questions that he's been answering for several years um, about different health effects, and you can go through the ages and find out, you know, what what your child, what you're dealing with now, and um, and get a, a great answer to those questions. Is there anything um, else that we need? Anything else you're working on that we need to point people to? Uh, well, there's some interesting things coming down the pike. We've got this big project up in Canada um, of following how kids actually use media in a mobile digital environment um, and um, checking in with them year after year on their level of health and development and what's going on. So um, stay tuned for findings from that. I would say that uh, that many times podcasts such as this end up generating more questions for listeners than answers. Um, so I would encourage them to come to either our website that's on the screen or to askthemediatrician.org. Um, and I would love to be stumped. Uh, we will answer your questions in ways that are based in the science, that are balanced, that are not values-based, but are very practical things you can do when you go home uh, tonight. Um, and um, to really follow uh, our role, which is enjoy your media and use them wisely. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been fun. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I had pages, <laughs> more pages and pages of questions, um, but I, I'll go to ask the mediatrician. <laughs> Right. Or we can do this again if you want. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know I mean, how I, to hunt me down. <laughs> yeah. It's funny to like now force my kids to watch TV. It's like, all right, we're all watching TV together. Come on. You know, like I never thought I'd get that point it's where, an event. yes, where, where we didn't have the TV and now it's like, we're all going to do it together and you're going to put your phones away and we're going to watch TV. You're going to like it. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Well, hey, I'll you. tell you something that's really worked with my, my, you know, your kids are older than this now, but the first um, screen media I did with my kids was uh, Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton Silence. And they absolutely loved them. Um, but, you know, when their friends would come over, they would say, where's the color? Where's the sound? I don't get it. Um, and, and there is, you know, in the law of unintended consequences, um, uh, there's a great one reeler from Charlie Chaplin called 1 a.m. where he comes home drunk um, uh, and, you know, basically fights with everything in his house from the pendulum on the clock to the, the lion, uh, the bearskin rug. And um, my son in first grade wrote an essay about getting drunk um, <laughs> and how funny it was. And <laughs> the teacher... I, you know, asked if she needs to be concerned about what's going on at home. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, you do have to be concerned. I'm not following the mediatrician, mediatrician's rules. I'm showing my children bad stuff. <laughs> so everything, everything that can happen will. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, take care. Thank you well, so much. Thank you. We'll talk soon. All okay. right. Bye-bye. Bye. And thank you so much for joining us on Triangulation. Triangulation records every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific. And you can watch it live at twit.tv slash live, or you can watch it on your podcast catcher of choice whenever you want. You can watch it or listen to it. Just go to twit.tv slash try. We also have a flash briefing and it's available in more countries now. So just go to your Alexa app, choose Customize my flash briefing. Choose the Twit flash 
briefing, move it up. We have fresh content every single day. So check that out. Definitely. And, uh, we will be next week. Uh, the show will be hosted by either Leo or Padre or Jason. So come back. Uh, we love having you asking your questions too. You can go to irc.twit.tv and ask your questions in the chat room. And you can find me on uh, Tech News Weekly every Thursday at iOS Today, every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.